Are you thinking of leaving corporate, but too afraid to make the move? Have you already escaped corporate, but are finding it hard to run your dream business? Are you wasting valuable time by attempting to figure challenges out on your own? We have created a podcast for corporate escapees running their own business. This is the Corporate Escapees Podcast by Build, Live, Give. We bring you firsthand experiences of guests going through many of the struggles you face each and every day as a corporate escapee. We get real with no corporate BS. And now over to your host, Paul Higgins. Hello and welcome to Corporate Escapees, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of people who are successfully running their own businesses, hearing their war stories and motivations for making the jump from their corporate gig. I'm your host, Paul Higgins, and our guest today is someone who started his entrepreneurial journey in Indonesia, and he's got some great learnings that he shares today. Also, he realized that he had some gaps, so he wanted to gain more experience and went back to corporate and did a major M&A role in a packaging business. But then he constantly saw pain points through his friends and then went on to create a world exclusive co-working and co-warehousing space. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Harry Kempler from Click Collective. Welcome Harry Kempler from Click Collective to the Corporate Escapees podcast brought to you by Build Live Give. So we're going to get to know a lot about you today, Harry, but why don't we start with something that your family or friends would know about you that we wouldn't? Uh, I guess my family and friends usually uh, tell me that I'm always in, imitating and mimicking people's accents. So I seem to have a bit of a, a fascination with, uh, with foreign accents that I love impersonating. Great. And what are some of your favourites to impersonate? Uh, good old Irish. Uh, my gym instructor is actually South African, so usually we have a bit of a, a bit of a laugh about about uh, about South African South African accents as well, and uh, and just just yeah, <laughs> anything really. <laughs> Excellent, great, and and um, tell us a little bit about your corporate escape story. I know you've got a, a rich background and uh, now doing some exciting things, but tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, yeah, so look, I started. Uh, uh, my corporate background was really in, in, in m and I worked for a private packaging company for a couple of years, about three and a half, four years. And uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I loved what I did there. I actually really enjoyed the whole corporate experience. Um, being able to kind of the, the commercial side of things, understand the analysis, that was always something that I really felt very, um, like I, I really enjoyed. And I liked the team as well. Um, I guess for me though, uh, looking around the room and just seeing what, the ladder was and where I was going to, where I was going and, and, and seeing who I wanted to be in, in five or 10 years from there. Uh, that was probably where it came a little bit short for me. So although it was great learning, um, I really felt that I just couldn't really align with my values and what I really wanted to do with myself and for myself. So it was probably within that window. I looked at, I looked at a few opportunities outside of work um, and then made the call to actually, to actually jump and, uh, and, uh, and do my own thing. Great. And, and was it, uh, you know, over a, a long period or was it sort of you know fairly instantaneous once you had that thought you thought no corporate's not for me i'm going to uh, leave um well i think that actually i probably even go back to answer one question paul that about the escape itself and that's probably that before i even joined a corporate organization i actually um tried something entrepreneurial myself so for me i actually tried to bypass the whole corporate the corporate world altogether so i know that entrepreneurship was always something that i uh, i really admired and a lot of people that i saw that had done it well i kind of really respected um and i just knew that i wanted to be working for myself at some point in time so before i actually worked for a packaging conglomerate here in in, uh, in melbourne i actually um was living in indonesia and I was working for a was a friend and I um, uh, started like a we started out with a with a coffee business over in Jakarta, Indonesia, and uh, and that was basically a whole lot of learning about uh, about things that you uh, things that work and things that don't work. Um, and so when I came back from that experience in Indonesia after about a year um, of living over there, I realised it probably was a few too, a few steps too far ahead of myself. And wanted to actually go back into corporate to learn some of the kind of core skills and development. So I think to answer your question, I always knew that I wanted to do my own thing, um, but wanted to find something that was actually viable and something that could actually work. Great. And what were sort of your top three lessons from the coffee business? Uh, 
yeah, top three lessons from the coffee business. I, I think the first one would just be understanding the market and the minimum viable product that you're actually offering. Um, so it, I think when most startups or entrepreneurs really want to get out there and try something, it's it's full of excitement. It's full of, you know, oh, this is a great idea. Um, I'm sure I'm sure people, you know, will love this. This will really work um, without actually, I guess, proper testing and going out there and, you know, just, just taking the jump as well. That was that was probably a, a, a bit of a, a premature a premature jump for me. Um, I think the other the other lesson in that was that you kind of also do see when you don't follow things all the way through to the same level that you want them to be done, you can see how things can unravel. So just kind of taking a full ownership, uh, although things are set off being fun, you're there with like a friend or even some support. I think that at the end, you know, you you really have to back yourself and know what you're what you're doing in your own personal journey. So I think that that needed to align with that as well. That would be a, a big lesson in in um, in in doing that. And the third probably lesson that I would have learnt was was also I think that uh, actually being in a home ground advantage um, versus a, a, a foreign country with different rules, regulations, different language. That was also a challenge. Now that's actually something that was wonderful on one side of it, but it was also something that was was quite difficult to actually. Um, excel in, in, a, in a very foreign environment as well. So a lot of learning on the way and I actually reflect on it quite fondly but at the time we felt that it was exciting then it became a little bit stressful that we weren't actually getting the kind of traction that we wanted to achieve. Great and when you first you know left the the uh, packaging business uh, like you said you had a fantastic career but you knew it wasn't for you, what were some of the key fears that you were facing when you first took that step outside of corporate again, I suppose, um, into small business, given some of the the uh, challenges you had in Indonesia? Um, well, I think the second time around was a lot more, um, uh, it was slightly more mature look on, on, on things and, and how I probably had a much better understanding about what I wanted to achieve with it. So it wasn't so much the fear of um, I couldn't pin it down to one fear. It was just about will this work, but I've done a lot of the work behind it to ensure that it did. Mm-hmm. So we, so we would take um, uh, groups before I even took the first lease over in our warehouse in Kensington um, had, had uh, insight groups around it really tried to understand not just one or two customers, but a segment over, over a couple, like, you know, a dozen or two um, and really trying to build out um, our proposition. And understanding about what would actually work, so I was like a lot more confident in terms of what would actually, um, if the idea would take off or not, uh, the second time around. So I think that boiling down to a single fear, uh, yeah, just it's more it's more a combination of excitement and who's going to come through the door and who that customer is going to be. But I I haven't actually quite looked back to kind of say um, you know this is really just uh, too much overwhelming. It can be challenging. But it's been more exciting than anything else, to tell you the truth. Great. And uh, as far as help, who sort of helped you as you made that transition, um, whether it's mentors or particular books or podcasts, sort of what help did you get during that transition? Um, so with the, with the transition over the um, into Click, uh, I've got, um, again, family and friends who are, who are, who are, who are entrepreneurs and, and, and it's always great having someone that's gone through that journey that can really, um, you know, step you through it. So it's, although it's been exciting, it certainly has had its challenges. Um, and I think that, that that ability to kind of turn to someone that's gone through that um, and kind of explain that, look, that's actually normal. It's okay when you're going to face, you know, if, if, a, if a supplier has under-delivered on a promise and you can't fulfill that to your customer, you kind of feel really... Um, you know, like, like you really haven't done the, the right job, or you you haven't put in, you haven't put one hundred and ten percent in, even though you feel that you've done everything possible. Um, things can still go wrong, and that's okay because some things will go wrong in business, like in every business. So I think that having that mentorship and support from um, family members that are, that are entrepreneurs, and also um, another business uh, mentor that I've got, who's been um, great over the last couple of years, and is currently a director. Um, in my company as well, he's been just wonderful. Even on you know just during weekends, um, going for walks, pick up the phone, always available to just kind of walk through challenges and opportunities and, and assess that. So it, it certainly isn't something that uh, I think uh, it can be very isolating and lonely. Having people around that can just kind of pull you back up to say, "Hey, this is this is just part of it." That's been really really helpful. 
great. Well, look, the next section is the build section. And when someone says, Harry, what do you do for a living? Uh, how do you answer that? Yeah, so what I do is uh, is is co-working and co-warehousing to support online retails in their journey. Um, and what that means is that um, part of part of what people ask that question, I've got to explain what I do because no one else actually does that. Yes. So that's probably the first thing is that when they say to you, what do you do? I've got to explain a bit of what, what have we actually created over it with Click Collective. And uh, everyone knows that co-working um, in an office environment is, is, uh, is really taken off. People don't want to be isolated. They don't want to be living at home, doing their work as a freelancer. They want the freedom, but that freedom comes with isolation. That freedom comes with, um, you know, having to go at it and without actually the support of a community or, or the support of, again, other people around. So while we were seeing all that growth in, in, in office environments, um, uh, I saw this amazing industry of online retail um, and people um, that were taking the plunge and being able to sell online and do things in e-commerce, um, but they also had stock. They needed a physical space to actually hold their product, whether it's sampling or actually fulfilling from that space. And they were quite isolated and alone. So what I do is bring together um, that, what Click Collective does is bring together um, the co-working element, but in a, in a warehousing environment. Um, so we provide warehouse units as well as office spaces, but also provide um, workshops and, and, uh, and, a, and a community around what everyone is doing. And, uh, and that, that's what I do is bring together that element for online retailers want it to be in a communal a community a shared environment for warehousing and offices mm, brilliant and uh, look you know i've certainly been to your one in kensington and uh, um you know the growth of it's been fantastic how did you come to that idea like there's so many things that you could have turned your hand to why did you choose to solve that problem uh so i yeah another 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 good question i had a couple of friends who were online retailers or who still are still have actually pretty pretty decent uh operations going and um one girl in particular um a good friend she just taken a, a a lease on a warehouse space um out of melbourne and uh she was facing a lot of those challenges and and she faced the challenge of being you know a startup a two-year-old one-year-old business moved out of home took out a lease in a warehouse she was by herself she was had to go a bit further out. She was disconnected from our from our group of friends, um, and a lot of other friends were talking about how amazing it is being in co working environments. And I really wanted to offer a solution that would tailor something to her needs. Actually, um, although I'm using her as a prime example, there were a few there were a few a few friends I know that had gone through that, and I was like, no one's really offering to solve that problem for them. Um, and it's an industry which is actually quite new. So although it's actually got amazing growth, it's got um, amazing opportunities for people that want to have a go because it's such a big industry and you can sell globally. Uh, no one was really pulling together to create a sense of community, a sense of belonging to people that are going through that same journey. So I wanted to solve that problem because I could see there was something very real in front of me. I'm a very tangible kind of person. So I said, I actually, I think I can help. Um, and I was aware about this warehouse in Kensington um, and I ended up taking a, yeah, just, just going for it. And, uh, and, uh, and there we had, you know, a couple of dozen, um, online retailers join and, uh, create what is now Click Collective. Great. And, uh, your business model, what does your business model look like? So our business model is uh, essentially it's, it's, it's sub licensing areas of space. So we would take out large areas Put in the work to subdivide it, create the create the both the environment as well as the as well as the functionality, which is needed for these guys to fill their to fill their fulfillment or their operations. Like it might be a loading dock, um, goods um, goods moving equipment, all that kind of stuff. And we just sub license it at a higher price to what we actually lease out at. So it's that it's that value add between wholesaling of of, of space and and uh, and retailing. Um, and then in addition to that, we've got um, strong corporate partnerships, um, particularly with Australia Post, um, who have provided incredible support through um, combining all of our all of our like logistics spends together. So we can offer really advantageous pricing to our members um, and we give them an extra benefit and service for that as well. 
Um, so there's a couple of layers of service that we offer in addition to the actual space itself. Great. And as far as, um, you know, I'm, I'm not aware of anyone else like this, a concept like this in Australia or in the world for that matter. Have you seen anybody else doing what you're doing? No, I, I haven't. I haven't is the answer. Um, everyone asked me that question when they walked through Kensington and, uh, and we're opening another space now in Rapid, which will be open next month. And, and they are asking, you know, where'd you see this first? And, uh, and the answer was that it was a combination of co-working, but also identifying isolation, um, you know, pain points and, uh, and growing points of, of friends and people that's in that, in that, in that industry. But it's been really challenging because we don't have the, um, anyone to look at to kind of say that's 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 the way to do it we're kind of we're kind of on the run making making things happen as we go along um so at the one time it, it's it's great you know in, a, in, a, in an environment that's a lot of competition um but at the same time it's also quite challenging because you've got to you've got to be that that provider that is actually finding the way forward so uh i have not seen it i've not seen the concept the way that we've put it together uh working um somewhere else overseas or in australia yet Mm, no, and I think that's why um, it's going to be so successful because it is uh, unique and it comes off solid research, like you said. And look, um, there's a bit of a myth out there at the moment around profitability of uh, e-commerce businesses where, you know, I often hear on podcasts people say, oh, e-com businesses just aren't profitable. Don't go into them, uh, you know, go uh, target other areas what's your view on that and have you found that with your community whether there is good profit in uh, e-commerce it's another great question and uh and the answer is some people can make a lot of money through um through establishing an e-commerce business um there's no doubt about that um and like i said that first hand that that exists the other thing probably to i think note is that this can also be a lifestyle for people. I mean, small business owners don't necessarily always get into get into a business in order to um, to have, you know, hugely global ambitions to kind of take over the world in five years. Like you see a lot of people on their on their um, on their presentations of what they're going to do in the future, next five and ten years down the track. I think that I think that um, for a lot of retailers today, if you look at like a high street shop, I mean. It can make a bit of money, but actually sustains a lifestyle they actually enjoy, they actually like. Mm-hmm. So people that like to create something, make something, sell something, um, it's just that they've always ex- that that that's always existed. So people that have um, you know entrepreneurs have decided to say, hey, I want to just sell my, I'm going to make some products, I'm going to set up a high street store and I'm going to sell it. Um, that's their lifestyle. So not necessarily doing it a hundred percent just because they want to make a ton of money. Obviously, everyone wants to make money. Uh, it's got to be profitable. Um, but you know, it also can sustain their lifestyle. So um, I think that in some of the areas of, that I've seen um, on my retailers be successful, some have actually made you know a lot of money, and others actually it's fulfilling their life ambitions in order to be a maker, creator, seller, and they love the industry what they do. Mm, yeah, great, and. Uh... As far as profitability, um, you know, have you gone about improving the profitability of Click Collective? Well, apart from the space, obviously, just um, the the wholesaling and, and subleasing uh, model, um, which is our bread and butter. It's the additional services and corporate partnerships in, in front of that as well. So again, um, with the Australia Post example, it's being able to add value to people's actual P and L and what they spend in their logistics, and how we can actually um, really help them out in that in that aspect, and and, and Click Collective as well. Um, so probably the first one is corporate partnerships, and the next one would be just efficiencies, just understanding what really how we can operate, you know, leanly, um, but also provide a great service. Great. And uh, I know there's a lot of people that would love to have a, a partnership like Australia Post. Um, I think, you know, it's great that you've got that. Just give us a bit of an insight as to how that came about. Like what what did you learn from that experience that other people could uh, take from? That came about through, I guess, having multiple discussions. At, like the, obviously Australia Post is a very large corporate with a lot of different, um, they've got 50,000 employees around Australia and they're, and they're a iconic Australian brand. In fact, they're, um, I think they're an exceptional organisation. 
but at the same time, they've, they've been faced with a lot of challenges of a changing industry. Um, in the last decade, they've gone from a letter business to a parcel business. So they're also trying to um, create services which they weren't designed to create. So although they're 200 years old, they're actually, in, in essence, most of their business is actually less than a decade old in terms of what mm-hmm. they're actually selling and fulfilling. Um, so we were speaking with the um, innovation team just around some of those challenges and, uh, and just through that ongoing dialogue. Um, uh, you know, on our journey, we saw a lot of similarities and they really wanted to be able to support um, small businesses, but they also don't cater to that. They're, being a corporate, it can be difficult um, to give the attention and the, and the service um, to all these startups and small business operators. So having someone that actually can help aggregate and put them into a single location, um, we were able to say, look, why don't we join forces to kind of offer that service and help people out in that way as well. And so that really aligned with their thinking. Um, and from and from there, we just established a, um, a partnership out of it. Okay, great. And uh, your team, how big is your team? Uh, so we have five people in the team now. Uh, it's a pretty um, tight team, and that's over two locations. Um, Kenzie and obviously been there for a couple of years, and we're having starting uh, next month. Uh, and, yeah, so it's a team of five. Great. And what have been some of the biggest learnings for you having your own team versus being of a team member in corporate? (laughs) Yeah. So that another excellent question. Um, We are, we're we're a young business as well, like a lot of our customers are. And I think finding people's strengths and, uh, and actually managing people uh, has been probably a, a, a very big learning curve for me. Um, but something which I actually have really enjoyed at the same time as well. So I think like any any new company, new employees, you're kind of a problem solving um, in an industry and market which is evolving, um, as well as adapting people who are new themselves and identifying their skill and how that can come together. So how do you kind of manage that growth, identify roles, responsibilities, and and you're wearing many hats in the beginning as well. So we're looking for kind of you know people that can people that are comfortable with change around and people that are comfortable doing you know, multitasking um, and everything from whether it's a, a bit of a, a bit of a sales conversion type of role to actually a community engagement or a workshop or something that can actually be helpful and useful around the warehouse. So we're always, um, so trying to pull that together um, has been a challenge in itself, but it's been, it's, it's been really rewarding at the same time. Great. And do you use any particular way of assessing people's ability to, to handle change? Is um, you know, that part of the interview process or have you got other um, diagnostics that you use? Um, look, it's probably not as scientific as the diagnostics and the, uh, and, and the skills, to be honest. Uh, it's really just sitting down with people and meeting them a couple of times, going through their CV, their experience, seeing if they're... If they're um, uh, you know what they can bring to the table and how they kind of fit in with it. I wish I could give you a, a great scientific answer behind it, um, but I think that in reality, it's it's uh, it's it's been a little bit less, um, a little bit more about about a gut feel as well as reviewing obviously references and and your CV and the, and the standard stuff. Um, that's been that's been um, the approach to date. Sure. And uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face right now? I believe you about to open a, another centre, so you must uh, have a lot on your plate, but what are some of the biggest challenges uh, <laughs> you face at the moment? Yeah, I haven't slept for the last probably two months, Paul. It's been a, it's been a very, uh, very busy, busy period um, setting up for the new, the new location. Um, so the challenge has been really pulling it together from project management to literally marketing to um, how we can actually grow our community from one part of town to the other um it's been pulling together every single aspect of that biggest challenge has been um my time actually just to be able to actually attend to everything at the same amount of care that i'd like to um i just find that's been that's been very difficult at the moment Mm, and is there any suggestions on how to do that like what what's worked for you well in in um you know preserving time or or getting the best out of your time uh, well, that's probably um, through the team being able to trust who I'm working with. They can also deliver on the aspects that once we can't attend to everything 100%, um, we, we know we can rely on each other 
So I think that that, that biggest um, support has been amongst the team, look, can you please handle this and deal with it and come back together and see how we're going? So really that's been the only way to deal with that is just through having, um, you know, an establishment of trust amongst your team. That's the only way to deal with the time issue. Well, before we go into the next section, I'd like to mention our first corporate event called Corporate Escapees, and it'll be in Melbourne in Harry's new facility, which is a Click Collective. It'll be on the 19th of September, and it's from 6.15pm uh, to around 9. And uh, Harry's got a, a fantastic space there, so I strongly recommend you come down and look at it, both from a co-working point of view and also from a, a co-warehousing, but also we'll have three brilliant corporate escapees, one being Harry, talking further about their journey and also helping our community, the people that uh, turn up to remove any blocks that they've had. And as Harry said before, you know, turning to friends and family that have been there and, and done that is uh, so important. So uh, we'd love to have you uh, attend. So it's on the 19th of September at 615 and uh, you can find out more at buildlivegive.com. So the next section, Harry, is the live section. And just tell us about um, your normal routine. I know at the moment things are a little crazy, but tell us a little bit about the normal routine you've got, all the habits that help you be successful. Yeah, the routine, I think you picked, you hit the nail on the head there, Paul, that the routine is not normal at the moment. So <laughs> up at up at many hours of the night and uh, really finding it difficult to actually get some shut eye. But uh, I think that, like you know looking after yourself is obviously is obviously cr crucial i mean i try to go to the gym at least two three times a week which again have been neglecting in the last in the last two months um and also taking a bit of time out to to actually just be in a mindfulness state so i'd all i'd always try to um in the mornings or even just during the day take 15 20 minutes out just to myself to actually um either meditate or just get to a state of mindfulness in terms of what you're doing and just bring it all back to kind of you know it's manageable and let's tackle everything, you know, one by one. So I think some of those, um, you know, keeping that up regularly, whether it's exercising, meditating, it can be different things for other people. I think that that's the kind of um, the habits that I find, um, you know, use, use, they work for me. Great. And, uh, and I believe your uh, wife's name is uh, Banu. Banu, yes, yeah, Turkish yeah. Banu. Correct. Yeah, great. Uh, so when she listens to this podcast, what would you like to say to her about the support she's given you? Uh, look, she's she, her support's been unwavering. She's been um, incredible um, and and she, she and she knows she's super supportive. I tell her every day and, and I think that the days that I might forget to tell her, she, well, she'll have no problem reminding me as well. So, um, you know, we have a we have a wonderful relationship and she just um, has been incredible support and always very attentive always always there to listen um and break down the day so you know i yeah love and appreciate it every day brilliant and the the next section's the give section so what's a cause or a community that you're passionate about and why yeah you know i um i think before i started to click i used to i used to love going to like helping out at soup kitchens or or um just volunteering some time here and there, and whether it's a even amnesty rights and shit uh, organisations. But I, I think the last year or two, I've actually found a lot of a lot of um, joy in actually mentoring and helping other young entrepreneurs. Um, and that's really probably come out of my journey as well. That um, I was always getting very um, worked up about when I face a challenge or an issue. You know, it always feels like it's such a big. You know, why is this happening? To, why is this? Why has this gone wrong? Or how has it happened? And having it as someone that can really kind of sit down and say, look, this is normal. This is how to get through with it. It's actually not, not the end of the world, whether it's, a, whether it's a customer issue, a supplier issue, an employee issue. I think that I see that a lot now um, in, in my in, in Click Collective and in our industry. We're seeing a lot of that happen. And so being able to um, be there for people through that journey, I found that really rewarding because that's also something that you can share and say that's that's – a, that's normal. B, there's a way forward, and um, you know, being there for them for that, I found that very that one-on-one, -on -one, um, interpersonal kind of connections has been has been um, excellent. So I'm very uh, very motivated towards um, mentorship for young entrepreneurs. Great. And the last section is the action section. So just some 
questions and some quick rapid fire responses. So the first one is, you know, what are your top three productivity tips? To-do lists, very big on to-do lists. I uh, write them and add to them all the time um, and make sure I'm kind of ticking them off. Write down your goals. I think that that's really helpful. Um, always keeping the bigger picture in mind. Um, so being able to just pull yourself out if you're getting, kind of getting stuck into somewhere and just, just trying to understand what the bigger picture and the goal and the outcome is. And the third one would be knowing how to delegate and outsource. What are the tasks that really you're just going to, I'm going to be inefficient at, or won't be able to do it at the same level and trusting the team that, hey, this is where I need that support. This is what we need to deliver. Understanding of when and how to delegate. Great. And uh, some favorite apps or software that you use to help you run Click Collective? Yes, yeah, so we run uh, Slack has probably um, been an absolute lifesaver for us just in terms of community uh, communication. Um, that's, been, that's been great. We use Xero's just great software. Again, I um, love using that for all of our you know, accounting and uh, integration. And, and Trello has been really good as well for, our, um, for projects and for uh, even sales leads. Great. And some, uh, uh, a podcast or a book that you'd love to recommend and why? So uh, this year I've read Sapiens and currently reading a book called Homo Deus, which is, um, which are excellent books, which is really about the, uh, um, it, it's about the formation of, I guess, I guess humanity and how we've evolved and why we, why we accelerated as, as, as humankind over the last 10,000 years versus the last hundreds of thousands of years. So I really recommend those books. That's not really, not really a, a business book at all, but I've just, I've just really enjoyed Homo Deus. Um, podcasts, I always, I, I love listening to like kind of TED Med and BBC profiles. So TED Med, um, very into things around longevity and aging. I find them, I find those topics to be fascinating and, and recommend picking up um, or reading through some of, those pod, some of those podcasts. And the BBC profiles I enjoy because yeah, you, you never know who you're going to find out what their background and what their stories are. And uh, yeah, so another one I'd probably recommend. Brilliant. And uh, the last question is some parting advice. What would you like to leave as some parting advice? Just back yourself. Um, strongly, yeah. I've strongly just proven you've got a minimal viable product, but if you know that it can, if, you get, if you're getting that feedback, you know it can work, jump in with both feet, never go. Brilliant. Well, uh, look, you can find uh, all the links will be in the show notes and you can also find out about Harry and Click Collective. So it's C L I k collective so uh, only one c uh, at uh, clickcollective.com.au and for all of those that are in melbourne as i said we'll have a, a great event at uh, click collective on the 19th of september and i'd love to thank harry and his team for all the effort i know that it's such a big thing to launch something new but they've been very uh, helpful putting the event together and we look forward to having a lots of great events and uh, harry i already know that there's some people saying oh i wanted to check out that venue so um uh, some of our members uh, can't wait to go and see see the venue so um thanks a lot for sharing your great knowledge uh, today and wisdom and uh, well done for backing yourself jumping out with two feet and uh, I know all those e-commerce businesses uh, certainly in Melbourne and hopefully in the globe when you expand it will be better off for it so thanks for coming on today Harry. Oh thanks so much for having me here Paul really really loved it cheers. Cheers. <laughs> what a wonderful interview with Harry so my top three takeouts of this interview is one find a mentor so find a mentor that can support you someone that's been where you're about to go to the second is corporate partnership he's got a great relationship with australia post and that's really made a difference to his profitability so how can you work with large partnerships and the third is around getting a balance between lifestyle and financials so you know it's not always about making the most money it's about having the lifestyle that you love so if you've got some key points or you've got some questions i'd love to hear from you just email me at paul at buildlivegive.com and also if you've got some friends that are in corporate looking to escape or they've escaped corporate recently please share harry's journey with them so that we can help people find both lifestyle and financial freedom thank you for listening to the corporate escapees podcast brought to you by the team at build live give 
If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with other corporate SKPs. If you would like to join a community of like-minded peers, please visit www.buildlivegive.com. Until next time, thanks for listening and be brave.